now it's okay hello my name hello. is blakely strength and i am a community art student what is your name my name is Aline McKillop. I'm an old lady. <laughs> really old. Well, I have a couple of questions. Well, more than a couple, it's a whole page, but. <laughs> oh. So if, if you see me looking down, I'm looking at the paper. Oh, here we go. Or in place around or near Buck's Ledge that you have a connection with. What's that again? Is there a certain place around or near Buck's Ledge that you have a connection with? Not really. I just look at it. I remember looking at it from South Pond and looking across the lake, North Pond and looking across the lake and seeing it up there and saying that's Buck Ledge, but I've never climbed in. Okay. I heard you talk about the pond. Do you live on the pond or do you live around the pond? I live right there by the pond. I can just walk my back field and uh, walk right down to the lake. Okay. Do you have any history stories to share about Buck's Ledge or a nearby area? Not really. No. Any of the area, Mother? The area? Mm -hmm. no, all I know about Buck Ledge is what I see it and hear about it. A little information on some history that you've dealt with. Hmm? Talk about the history a little bit that you remember. Of, of Bryant Pond? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You want to talk about that? Oh my, that goes a long ways back. Um, where I lived when I was young uh, was on Church Street, the furthest end towards uh, near where the rail near the railroad tracks, and uh, it was a dirt road. Uh, pretty narrow and we always had to walk to school. Uh, there was no school buses, not when I went to school. And uh, some children had to walk a long ways. They had to walk maybe almost three miles to come to school. And back then everybody seemed to walk to have a graduation certificate. And I remember two families, especially the Allen family and the Yates family, they lived way down by uh, Black Brook. And it was almost three miles. And in, they walked to school in the window. Nobody gave them a ride, they just didn't have they just didn't do it then. And uh, they'd come to school pretty much sometimes with snowstorms, they'd have they'd have pretty covered with snow like that. And back then the girls were not allowed to wear pants in school. They had to bring they had to bring a dress that they could change into or tuck it underneath the snow pants because it was really, really cold in the winter back then when you had to walk every mile. And they, they all, I remember they all wanted to graduate and they'd come to school pretty cold. <laughs> how many graduated mom? You started hmm? out in like in high school and how many graduated? Oh, when I started out in high school, it was, I think there was about 15 in my class. And then, uh, then it was getting near, when it, the time I graduated, uh, 
there were no boys left in my class, just six girls because of the World War II. The, uh, all the boys had to just disappear. They either went in the service or on the farms. And uh, there was just six, six of us girls left to graduate. And that was in 1944. Is this the class of Woodstock High School? Mind what she's saying? Was this one of Woodstock High School, Mom? Yes, this is Woodstock. It's right here, right near this building. Yeah, Woodstock High. That's where all the classes were from the primary to the senior class. And all the upstairs was just high school. So freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior classes. They were all upstairs in one big, big, big room. The principal, Mr. Redmond, sat up front and all the others sat. The freshman class sat first rows and then the sophomores and the juniors and the seniors were privileged. They had the back seats. But it was an all it was an open thing, and I'm telling you, Mr. Redmond had, well, he had control. <laughs> there was no foolishness going on with Mr. Redmond. Yeah. Did you did you keep in touch with your classmates? What you say? Did you keep in touch with your classmates? Did you yes, yes, we did. I have two classmates left. Uh, one's in Bethel, and the other one is living with her son. I don't know where where the, he's living right now, but I do. The others are, have passed away in the meantime. Yeah. What are ways that you connect with nature in the past and now? Always, we always had a garden. Still do. Last year I canned 60 pints of zucchini relish and uh, 104 quarts of tomato spaghetti sauce. <laughs> that was, we had a lot of tomatoes last year. Did you eat spaghetti and meatballs with it? Did you say, Vaughn? Did we eat spaghetti and meatballs? We had plenty of chops away. Yep, we have butter, Nizuki, and we have uh, chops away, and the other one, <laughs> well, I made last couple of weeks ago. Oh, oh, lasagna. Lasagna. Sorry, my mind doesn't pick up everything quickly. <laughs> it's all right. Same sometimes with me as well. <laughs> One minute I might be thinking about a math problem and the next I see a squirrel outside and I'm just like, squirrel. <laughs> well, you, think you, you like, uh, as far as nature, the birds, you've always been. Oh yeah, we always feed the birds. And we always usually, we had a cow and calves and uh, and hands after a while, but um, it just, we always had a lot of, always a lot of kids around. I had five children myself, plus we always seemed to be bringing in more, more children <laughs> to, to live with us. And uh, so we always had plenty of milk, whipped cream, and, uh, Always made our own homemade ice cream in the winter time. We had a churn that made a gallon of ice cream. Kids would take turns, churn in the ice cream. So that was always a Sunday, Sunday special. Hmm. Yeah. And then and the kids learned to take care of animals. We always had dogs, cats, and like I say, cows and calves. And and what? Butter. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I heard that you were passionate about adoption. 
Actually, we I took, we took yeah, we took in uh, different families, and uh, they they lived with us. We plan on keeping them forever, but one family they. The aunt took them after five years, which I was not very happy with, but that was just part of the thing. And then the next family was five brothers and sisters. It was three girls and two boys. And the youngest was just barely three. And I had had a late pregnancy. I had a two, two and a half year old when I was when they came, I was almost 40 when I had him. And uh, so they fit right in between my two and a half year old and I had Bonnie and Gregory was still with me, my, one of my, da my daughter and one of my sons. And, and so they fit right in between the three, the three year old and the 10 year old, fit right in between my three children that were still home. My other older ones were in the service. What were their names? What were their names? Which ones? The ones that I took in? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. There was Vicki, Brian. He was four when he came. Uh, Wanda was six. Susan was eight. And Duffy was 10. Okay. Do you think, wait, why did they need a new home? Did you say, Bon? Why did they need a place to stay? Why did they need a new home? Why did they need a place to stay? Well, uh, their mother had left them with their father. And I'm sorry to say he was Seemingly, he was an alcoholic and he had to go to Togas. And they took him to Togas and the five children are left all alone in some sort of a camp but, uh, with nothing. So finally, the oldest boy, 10, uh, called, called his grandmother, who lives somewhere down there in Norway, and they came and uh, called their mother, who was in Bangor at the time, and she immediately uh, called the state and turned them over to the state to take care of them. And so uh, the gentleman uh, had been, I've been associated with, with other children. He called me up and he says, Aileen, uh, can you take five children? And I says, what, all at once? <laughs> and, and he says, well, only, we're trying, we found a place in Rumford, we could place one. And we're looking for places for the others. But um, I had been talking with him for quite a few years, and I think he knew me. Uh, and said, well, only for a couple of weeks, but he knew me enough to say once they came, I wasn't gonna be kicking any children out. I didn't want to separate them. And so they lived with us until they all graduated and got married and still around. Most of them are still around and come and visit me. I'm still their mom. Were they, were they, were they a foster family? Yes. Okay. Did you adopt them? Well, they weren't allowed, we weren't allowed to adopt them at, at the time. I remember that one woman wanted to adopt the two children, two girls that she brought up. It was in the paper too. And, uh, the girls wanted her to adopt them. And the minute the state found out about it, they took the two girls away and there was nothing they, she couldn't communicate with them. They couldn't, she, then the girls couldn't communicate with her. They just took them away. And so 
I was told one of, one of the children, one of the children that we took in, that the mother said, do not say adopt. And, and so we never did. And uh, they just, they just, my children they were wonderful. They just took it. They absorbed these children that came in and just took over and treated them just like brothers and sisters. So it's just like brothers and sisters. And it's just a family. That's what it is. We read an article about your late husband, How, How, How Howard, Howard, and read that he was adopted as a child. Did that influence your decision to adopt to um, take in more children? Okay, she had read where dad was adopted. Yes, did that sure. influence yeah. you any in taking in these children? Did that enter into the picture? At all? Uh, I don't know. We just, I can remember the first, <laughs> first one that was brought into our home. We owned the store at the time here in Bryant Pond. And uh, he knew a family. The, uh, the mother had left. He and the father and this boy were living in a camp, a woods camp over on Row Hill, way back in the woods. And the father landed in the hospital. He was an elderly man. The boy was about 14 years old and uh, he started getting into a little trouble of taking things. It wasn't his, but it was because he was associated with another boy that did it and uh, was training him how to do it. Anyway, this boy was, I had a lot of little trouble. My husband brought him home. He said he needs a place to stay. We just came right in. So we just took him in and uh, when he got, he was 14 at the time. When he got graduated from high school, he was really respected. He was the only one that was allowed to handle the money for the tickets of the shows that went on over in the gymnasium. And he went into the service, into the Navy and uh, he was in there for, he was in there during the uh, Vietnam War. And uh, then he was, then he was released and, but he got killed in an automobile accident after he was out of the service. And that was the first one that was brought in. And then there was, a gentleman that uh, Howard did talk to it, and uh, he dropped off two of his grandchildren. One was two, one was four, because they, the father wasn't paying the people to take care of them, so he left us with those two little children. The sister was living with the grandmother. She was about seven. And she insisted that she wanted to be with her brother and sister. And so they had to let her come so that the three of them were together. They were, they were here for, um, let's see, Paula was two. And um, they were with us for five years before an aunt took them to Boston, Massachusetts, and not a best place in out of Boston, but that's all right, that's past. But, but they, they always, when they got away from, well, the boy ran away and then the, the two girls, they went to they finished school and the oldest one finally came back and uh, wanted to know if I remembered her. And, and of course I did. And so we had, we had a good connection there with her, but all three of them have, have passed away since then. And 
So those three are gone. Uh, then I had, I, the state has brought in other boys, another boy we had for two years until he graduated. Um, different ones, I don't know how many, about 15. We've had about 15, at least 15 different children that have gone through our house. <laughs> it's, it's an old house. It was born in, it was built in 18, around 1850. And, uh, but it's been, a, it's been a good house to raise a family in. And we've had a pasture out back that we could put cows and horses and ponies in so the children could be around animals. And they could go swimming anytime they wanted to. That was good too. What was the most chat what was the most challenging part of raising your kids, your own or the ones you took in? The most challenging part of raising your kids. Oh, most challenging. I don't know. <laughs> Mom was never too challenged. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, they, they were, they were, you know, every child is different, and uh, mm -hmm. for, for one thing, so the the last bunch of them, uh, I had a challenge of trying to get vegetables into them. They weren't <laughs> used to vegetables, <laughs> and I had my I had my three year old. Eating, eating salads and like that. And then when they came and they wouldn't, they wouldn't eat salads. And so he decided he wouldn't. And, uh, but after they got away from the table, I see him sneak over to the table and start eating the, eating the salad. So, but they, they learned to eat. They were just used to chop suey, I guess. Just, well, really not, they really hadn't, eaten the, with the meat in it. They were just used to macaroni and just butter and stuff on it. And, uh, and it's amazing. I remember the three-year-old three girl, she climbed up on the sideboard, and opened up the cupboards, and she says, is this all ours? <laughs> and I said, yes, it's all ours, because she, she couldn't imagine all the cupboards, my cupboards are always full. My husband had, you know, we had the store and uh, he liked to make sure there was food around and the cupboards are always full, full of cereal and stuff like that. So she was amazed. What was what was the most rewarding what was the most rewarding part of raising your kids? Most rewarding what? Rewarding part of raising your kids. Oh, to see them, you know, to to graduate and like that and find, start their own families. And I now they they just spread out all over the place. <laughs> Jose, they're still, they're still family. I admire, I admire how, how, I admire that, about that the family. I admire that about you. Just how you can just take all these kids in and call them your family. I'm amazed at that. It's just incredible in my opinion. I'm sorry if I'm not making any sense. I'm probably not, sorry. Oh, I, well, I, I love kids. I love to see how they, how they grow. I want to see them live a life and not, I, I guess the last family, the, they kept asking him, they kept asking me about him. And every time I went to shopping or something, I'd see one of his relatives and they'd ask about him and they were surprised that he was still in school because seemingly he was the first one in his family to graduate. And uh, 
And guess what? He learned that when after he graduated, he, he got to be a sheriff's deputy. Can you imagine? <laughs> he was always telling me the things he was going to do that wasn't what I thought he ought to do. And then come find out he, he was a sheriff's deputy. <laughs> Okay, I heard that you used to be an art teacher and I would like to know what was your favorite part of being an art teacher? Well, I wasn't really an art teacher. I went to, I did teach a uh, class over here to school. They had two sixth grade rooms over here and I had one of the teachers asked me because I was taking lessons myself I had never taken art lessons we didn't have them in school when I went to school and my husband talked with a professor Motochi down in Norway and told him that I liked to draw but I had been told I needed to learn to draw in color and which I, I was doing pencil. I like pencil and pen. And so Mr. Matolti said I could come and try out for six weeks to see if I could stay. And so I went, you know, I loved it. And, but I wasn't an art teacher myself. I just, but I did come over and teach um, in that sixth grade class. I, I simple, you know, they, I just tried simple things at first, like squares or bowls, how you can make a fish bowl and stuff like that. And then just experimented with different things. And I've got that somewhere at home. I don't know where, but I had a whole bunch of pages that I'd bring over and then put them on the school board, chalkboard, and so that they could copy it and do what, I, and I did the last class I did one of the boys, he insisted that he wanted to pose for me. So I did one of the Barremont boys. I wanted to do a girl, because I was used to girls' faces, but the boy insisted <laughs> and enough so that we said, okay, and I did his, I did a portrait of him, and uh, it was fun. It was, uh, it was in the Friday afternoon, and uh, I'd come over every Friday afternoon, because I was still learning down to Professor Matolchi. I took lessons for about a year. Uh, the first thing I learned, Bonnie, I want to show you what the first thing I learned. You know how the, you see people taking a pencil mm -hmm. and you're going like this? <laughs> okay. I never could figure it out. Never. I, I didn't know what they, were, what they were trying to tell me. I just see pictures of people going like this. Well, the first picture, I, my husband told Mr. Matolchi that I like to do people. And so the first thing he put up was a, a Japanese doll. He put this doll on the table. Can you see it? Okay, can you see oh, that? Oh my goodness, okay. that's beautiful. And anyway, this Japanese doll he set on the table. And then I was supposed to draw it. So I'm drawing away. So then he shows me that, the head. Take this pencil and you get the, the on the pencil so far is the head. And then you go down the body. And he said, there's about seven pencil, oh, seven heads, the body is. So that was the first thing I learned, and it was that that was really enlightening. I really enjoyed that. 
so then from then on, we did all kinds of, um, I did it in color. I, I'm i still, when I paint, because I, I haven't been doing it lately because my eyes aren't that great. So how you when you first started but, before you took lessons when you were young. Okay, well, you know, I'll tell them about the color. My, the colors I use are a child's pencil, you know, um, color. You know that you get the, the pencil, the colored, um, Oh, yeah. yeah, and you you just put water to them, and you just watercolor watercolors. That's all it is, just a children's watercolor box. And I still I still used it, and all my colors, except when I I just watch the other women, they come find out you can get watercolors and tubes. But anyway, these are things I drew before I took art lessons. Like this is just pencil. I mean pencil and yeah. ink. These are mostly ink. But most of my things that I did in uh, ink, I always do it in pencil first. And you, I'll show you a picture of what I like. But I like women's hair. I like to do women's hair. You see that? Okay, first I do it. Just hold it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, that okay? Mm -hmm. All right. That I did, did in pencil. And then I do it over with ink. Well, you, you know you take a pen, you dip it in the ink bottle. Mm -hmm. I get a blob. I says, oh no, I've ruined it. I had a blob of ink there and it wasn't supposed to be there. So I made a little little ribbon out of the blob of ink. Sometimes and the biggest mistakes can make the most beautiful things. Running out of power. Oh, I'm running out of power. Okay. We got that figured out. Though. You're all set. I'm all set. Yep. Okay. But yeah, sometimes the biggest mistakes turn into the most beautiful things. Something else you want to show them? Uh, do you want to see some of the other things I've drawn? Yes, please. Okay. This one. This one is a lady. Oh okay. my word. That's amazing. Her name is Mommy. Sondheim, and she came in and posed for us. She was a wife of a teacher down there in South Paris. And uh, she came for weeks and weeks. It, we us, our art class was from nine o'clock in the morning till 12. We had three hours we, we could draw. And she used to come in each week, once a week, and we got a chance to draw her in different poses. We did her in, I did her in charcoal, and uh, I got all kinds of poses of her home and pencil and in the ink. And uh, then I, then Professor Matolchi, Matolchi, but you know, okay, it's, I need a drink. <laughs> I forgot where I put my water. This might be right here. I've got it. I've got it. Okay. My mouth is getting dry. <laughs> That's why I made sure I had something to drink. Okay, you drink too. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. The Professor Motolchi had me come in and I uh, had me sit right in front of her and do her face. And uh, did I get I don't a face? No, no, that's not, that's not her. Did okay. you ever draw any flowers? Okay, I'm going to show you this guy. One of, Brian, one of my boys, foster boys, brought this boy home because his parents hadn't picked him up. He went to Gould Academy. I don't know, I didn't know him, but my kids would bring kids home if they needed a place, I guess. <laughs> they said, <laughs> if you always find room for them, 
But anyway, this boy's name's Kevin. His parents ran a hotel in Bermuda and they weren't able to pick him up when Gould Academy closed for the summer. So Brian could play basketball with him, asked him to come stay with us. So he did. So while he was with us, he was a little guy, shot. He carried a boom box on his shoulder that was almost as big as him. <laughs> and like, he was a nice kid. And, but he, he gave me some pictures. And so I drew a picture of him. I, this is, um, can you see the port, port there? Okay. And I remember we had art shows up to Bethel. And uh, I took this picture up. And some of the Gould Academy kids rushed right over and said, oh, there's Kevin. And so they, at least they recognized the picture. <laughs> the first thing I had to draw down to, another thing I had to draw was, they hung this face on a fence. And I was supposed to draw that. Well, the first one, first one I draw, I drew was, I drew it small because I was never had much paper. When I was young, we didn't have much money. So we didn't have drawing paper. I just grabbed any scrap of paper I could find, draw on it. Well, I drew this small picture on a piece of paper and the professor told she says, had me get a big piece of paper and he says, Fill up the whole page. He was somebody from overseas. That's where he was. <laughs> he was he's a really good guy. And so I had to learn to draw bigger and fill up the whole page. So then there's another, like I say, I like to do faces. And this was a little girl. And uh, her father and mother were, were uh, Missionaries. Missionaries, mom? Missionaries. And uh, in Alaska. And uh, so I got a chance to take a picture of her and draw her. In fact, she grew up in town. I mean, this one this did. One, no, this one, one grew, this one grew up here in town. You know, you know that one? That girl? She went to school here. Yeah. Well, and, I think it's four. Yeah. Tell the story about Mikulski, uh, well, about when you, why you left. Um, yeah, I loved art class. I was, I was brand new. All the other women, there's about six or eight of them that had been taking lessons from him for years or been artists for years. And like I say, I was really, uh, really didn't know what I was doing. But I wanted to learn because someone told me that I could, that I should learn to do with colors, more with colors. And so that's why I wanted to take lessons. Well, what was my the, the um... You had to leave. Oh, so like why I had to leave, yeah. People. I took lessons for about a year, about once a week, we went to the ocean like that. And I did the um, one over the basin, my basin falls, but we would, did different things, a lot of different things, like uh, loon, he, he had stuff, he had animals, uh, stuffed birds, we had an owl, we did, I did that about time. Why I had to leave was because every time I brought home my paintings or drawings from art class, I had six young children there that wanted to see what I had done, what I, all the work I'd done down to the art class. And uh, then one day, this I'd been taking lessons, I don't know, almost a year. And uh, then I heard some of the women talk because they'd been taking lessons for years and they were talking about, oh, 
where they were getting a, we're gonna take, they were gonna draw a naked man in that class. And I thought to myself, hmm, how's that gonna go over with, with six little kids? <laughs> and I had to think it over and then I told him that I, I wasn't gonna take any more classes because I didn't want to draw a picture of a naked man and bring it home and for them to look at. And I told him that I had six children at home and after they graduated, that I might come back to take lessons. And uh, I did see him in Bethel one time, a couple of years later, they were having out, outdoor summer up there and I saw talked with him. He wanted to know when I was coming back. And I said, when, when they graduate, <laughs> they hadn't all graduated, but he just, he's died in the meantime. So that's what he said, well, I might die. And I said, well, it, it, I wasn't ready to go back to class because I really didn't want to expose my children to naked men. <laughs> I wanted them to have some clothes on. <laughs> Yeah, this is this was your first oil painting. This is my first oil painting. I wasn't too interested in outdoors, <laughs> but I've learned I've learned how. <laughs> and uh, the first day, we uh, this is over in Buckfield at Basin Falls, and the first day. He set me down because the other girls had been there, or I should say women had been there for years. So they knew what they wanted to do. They picked their places. And then when they got through, I picked, I picked the place. And so when they got through, I, I sat down here and looked at this scene. And I had the first day, all I had to do was draw it in pencil. I had to do all of this in pencil. And uh, Mr. Matolci would come along and I would have to get up and he would sit down in my place because he was very, very particular. You had to draw what was there. And uh, even a scene I remember down at the ocean, there was a sewer pipe or something coming out of the side of the, out of the side of the, place that was coming. He drew it in, but I said I when I I raced it. I didn't <laughs> want a sword fight coming out in my, in my picture. Anyway, this one was all in pencil. And then the next the next week when we went over to take lessons uh, for me to take lessons anyway, uh, the other girls knew how to paint. And so he said he says get out your palette and put your colors on it. And I said, I looked at him, I says, I don't know how. <laughs> and so he sat down and, and squirted out the colors on my palette and showed me how, you know, you're supposed to mix them like that. And so that's how I learned, you do it. And one thing about oil is, you know, we did just so much at, at a time because we only, I would say about three hours. And then we had, um, but oil will dry out by the next week, it would be all dried out. So you can paint right over it. And I can remember there was plants. There weren't, there weren't plants when we started, but we was over there all summer and they had, it was a rain, rainy season and they kept growing. So every time I had to make the plants taller or stuff like that, because you had to paint what he, he insisted you paint what was there. And so that was my first oil painting. It was fun. That, <laughs> I still that, rather do, I do have a, I still rather do people. I like people's faces. <laughs> oh, I like hostess. I always liked hostess. Yep, there's, this was a horse my husband liked the picture of, so I 
So I did him. I was always drawing horses when I was a kid. And uh, horses and, and faces. I like faces real well. I like to do hands, fancy hairdos too. And this is a, they had a stuffed loon down to the, uh, can you see that okay? Get the light no, just right now. Okay. Um, that was a stuffed loon down there. And I like, I like loons because we have them on the lake all the time. We can see them and hear them all the time. So different things like that. But like I say, I like faces better. This is the, I like the looks of this Indian. So I drew a picture of him. And like you can wrap it up this Pencil. Pencil's my favorite. Okay. This is Bryant, this is a Bryant Pond Railroad Station. The, uh, they wanted me to draw, the school teacher, past school teacher wanted me to draw, draw it and she just had a card, um, like a postcard picture of it. And I told her, I said, Mrs. Crockett, it's too small. I can't pick it out. And uh, so, there was a lady in town that had enlarged it a little bit and she brought it over. So they wanted me to draw this of the, of the railroad station. Because back then the trains were steam engine and uh, I didn't get a picture of the, uh, they must not have had the picture of the uh, water tower because uh, they made a big water tower for the railroad station because of the engines when they, by the time they came to Bryant Pond is seemingly quite a, quite a rise higher than South Paris. They had to stop and get water. And so they made a big water tower there. And the men that worked on the water tower for the railroad station built a small one in back of my house because they were was, were living there while they were working on that tower. But uh, it's gone. The little tower behind my house is gone. I got pictures of it. And the big tower is gone too. So when the station is gone too. Yeah. Everything's changed a lot. A lot of things have disappeared. <laughs> You know, 96 years is, is a lot of things in between. And I also learned that you come from a long line of, um, what are they called? Um, Instrum, okay. Musicians. Okay, I heard that you come from a line of musicians and I wanted to know what your favorite instrument was, if you had one. What's that? Musician, but he gets to the field. What our favorite instrument was. Oh, what was your, did you ever, did you ever play, Mom? I don't think, I think you played the piano. That's... I learned to play the piano when I was real young. And, but the only thing I had at home was a pump organ. You, when you pushed with your feet to get the air into it. <laughs> that was what I had to practice on. But I, I learned to play a little. I could I could pick out pick out tunes, but I never learned to I never was really into I like music and I like good music, but uh, never well, was no. tell them about your in the calendar there, the child, our relative has played the cello. Oh, I do have a relative a long time ago that was, um, he played a cello. He used to come to church in the summer. He had a summer place here in um, Bryant Pond. And he played the cello in church. And I can remember Bonnie, he was, he was working the strings or something, tightening it. Because it really impressed my daughter because the string broke. 
and jazz like that, but he could still play with the string broke. Yeah, okay. He was, there was, I have a picture here, but so I thought I did, of where he played down in the Dearborn Grove. They have a Dearborn Grove near the cemetery down here. And uh, right there, this is a picture of the Dearborn Grove. And he's up there on the stage, right, right there playing the cello, and that was a uh, cousin that used to come. He played in the Pops Orchestra in Boston. That, uh, and Gil Whitman, I don't know, you probably, uh, he had a, what did he have, a little game farm mm -hmm. up there, and he had, or oh, main, main, uh, main animals I remember here for a while. And Gil Whitman did, that was his father that played in the orchestra. And, um, you know, the wildlife den. Yeah, this, that, was, yeah that was a wildlife den, yeah. That was yeah, Gil, that's, that was my cousin Gil. And uh, he had all kinds of animals oh. up there. I remember my kids used to have the, uh, Go up and handle the animals or coons or was it the coons that you handle, Bonnie? Yeah, I, yeah. I got pictures of them with the handling Owl, the owls and bears. Mm -hmm. Didn't they have a skunk at home? Did she have a pet skunk? Yes, yeah, she had, yeah, Liz had a pet skunk. And they had some cubs. Yeah. They, 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 they had they had they had a bear up there. And, uh, Right at the entrance of Buck Sledge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there, you, there you go. That's right. That's connected right by right. Buck Sledge. What? Right. That's right by Buck Sledge. Yeah, that's right. It's on. Yes, on mm -hmm. on the other side. Right. Yeah. Yeah, he had. Uh, I remember the boys were catching the uh, all those snakes with the red bellies. With snakes. And used to give them. Get on um, Gil used to give them a quarter. <laughs> Speaking of a quarter, I can remember work uh, babysitting for several hours way back when, and I got a whole quarter. But, okay, and you can tell during the war. Okay, during the war, they had they built a little uh, house up back in my field and I wasn't living there then, but they built it. And then they asked volunteers to watch for planes that was flying overhead. And they, you had a book there, the pictures of the different kinds of planes and that you had to watch for. And then if you saw this plane, you had to telephone in to a certain place and tell them what you saw. And this is one of the things that they had that you wore. I have a pin somewhere at home that um, I volunteered. I was about, I think a high, um, because my boyfriend had gone in the service in the Marines. And so everybody was a gun haul, you know, about doing things for the, during the war. And so I volunteered so many hours a week uh, to watch for, to be a plane spotter. <laughs> Thank heavens I never saw one. <laughs> We're all thankful. <laughs> but we all had, you know, we all did what we could during the, during the war. And uh, we all had gardens to make sure that we could had food that didn't have to buy it from some, so that anything that was needed in the, in the service was provided. Um, I remember stamps for sugar and for gas, you had to have a stamp for that. I learned to cook at a real young age and uh, on 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 uh, summer, we the family, my father and mother, and Kenny and I, 
that was my brother. Uh, he, we had to go up on a mountain, I think it was Mount Speck, and we went blueberrying every year. And my father had a big backpack. It was, I think it held about a bushel of blueberries. And we had to fill that thing up. I remember filling the bottom part and he put in a section. So I suppose it wouldn't squat anymore. And then we filled up the top. We couldn't, we couldn't leave the mound until we had that full. And then when they came home and they, my mother canned them. And uh, that's what we ate for dinner every day. Uh, all winter, we'd come, come home from school because we could come home from school then because we lived in, you know, everybody had to live in town to, to, if they wanted to. We didn't take our dinners. I didn't, um, not the ones that lived in town. And we'd went home at noon. And uh, I remember it was blueberries and sugar and milk on them and a slice of bread with peanut butter. <laughs> then I'd run back to school. I like to run. It was, but they didn't have anything for sports for girls when I went to school. Uh, nothing. Because Mr. Redmond didn't believe girls should do sports. And, uh, but we did have a nice teacher that uh, would slip us girls over to the gym and we could play basketball. Uh, not with his approval, but it would be after school and we could play a little basketball. Then she also took us, had a little club that we could go out on picnics and walk up to Oak Hill and have a picnic here and there. So we, we did walk to Oak Hill and uh, we got our exercise anyway, because I like to run. So I'd run to school, I'd run home from school. So I got my exercise. What is your favorite thing to cook? What? Your favorite thing to cook. What did I th like to cook? Oh, well, I learned to cook first. It was a wood stove. Uh, that was the only st stove we had in the house, it was a wood, old wood stove and the had the oven in it. And uh, I learned to make a cake. I think probably I was eight, nine years old. And uh, the worst part of it was I liked to check it in the wood stove oven. You know, it was a little bit different than the ovens we have now. A little bit, you had to jerk it a little bit to open and shut it. And I always was making the cake fall in the middle. <laughs> but you know what I'd do? I'd fill it in with frosting. That would work good. That? That sounds delicious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now I like to make bread. Um, like Anadama bread and Texas brownies, cookies. I like things like that. Chocolate chip cookies are my favorite. I like chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> you do, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't, I don't have a. I have to give them mostly away now when I like to cook because I don't have a lot of kids around to, to eat it. Well, I don't really have any more important questions, but I do have fun questions. And I have been dying to ask them. <laughs> My first question is, if you could go, if you could be any animal in the world, what would you be and why? An animal? Yes, if you could be. What animal, animal would I be? And why? <laughs> well. Never been there, have you? Well, no. <laughs> I've, I've seen a lot of animals and I've fed a lot of animals. I don't know what one I'd want to be. <laughs> I'd probably no. want to be somebody's lap dog when I bond. Yeah, right. <laughs> my daughter's got a dog and she likes laps and <laughs> she sits in your lap. But the only thing, only problem with her is that 
when you leave, she doesn't want you to leave. And she back, 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 back. She's noisy when, when, you, when she doesn't want you to leave. Doesn't seem to bother when, she, when you come in, you can come in. Doesn't come back, but don't leave. <laughs> Okay, my next question is, if you could go anywhere in the world, where would you go? Where would I go? If you could go anywhere in the world. Gee, I don't know. I like Maine pretty well. <laughs> I think the furthest I've been is Florida. No, I think I'd stay in Maine. What I like Maine. <laughs> I know. I mean, I travel around in Maine and I I like Bryant Pond pretty well. I thank God every night that I was born in Maine and I live in, in Bryant Pond. I was born in Bryant Pond. Ooh. You know, right 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 close to where I live now. I, I was born in a house right in Bryant Pond. When were you born? When when? Mm -hmm. November 19th. 1925. Yeah, it's getting up there nearly a year, a hundred, isn't it? <laughs> I was thinking of that the other day. Oh my goodness, this is 22. I don't know if I think, I don't think I'm going to make it to 25. <laughs> I believe you will. I know you will. <laughs> what is your favorite color? Favorite color? Oh, I love a teal blue, a nice blue color. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Would you rather be a plane or a songbird? <laughs> be, be a what? Would you rather be a plane or a songbird? Songbird. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is your favorite food? What's my favorite food? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, I like scallops pretty well. I've never, Those, I've never had scallops. Scallops, okay. What else would I like? I like a good homemade slice of bread, toasted. I have another question. What advice do you have for building and keeping a good relationship? What would you say? What advice do you have for building and keeping a relationship? Oh, be kind to each other. Don't judge. Don't judge every, everything they do is not what you think they ought to do. Just be kind and try to, just try to see how, how they think things through to them. That's one of my strengths, being kind and seeing other people's point of views. That's, yeah. that's a strength that I have. Okay, what is your favorite drink? My favorite drink? Mm -hmm. Milk. I like milk. <laughs> yeah. If I had to, I like well, I like water. I don't get me there. I really like water, but uh, milk would be. I was brought up on milk. <laughs> mm. Okay. What is your favorite season? My favorite season. One? What time of the year? Favorite time of the year. Spring and summer. Winter, uh-uh, it's too cold. <laughs> I like, I like, uh, I like warm weather. Same. I do too. I have a love-hate relationship with winter. I like snowboarding, but I hate that it's cold. So. Yeah. <laughs> I can remember, but the only the only thing is when I was young was. The skis, they were just plain wood skis. And the only way you could keep them on was 
to tie them on. I put a rubber, jar rubber around them or something. I mean, it was so different. It was so difficult. More, but I liked it. I remember skiing some, except I remember going under the tip of one going underneath us crust and giving me a big flip, I landed on my back. <laughs> that was that was a little surprising. I'm laying there looking at the sky. So how'd I get here? Do you have any other do you have any other advice to help us protect the environment? I don't know that working on it pretty hard right now, but I'd say don't throw your stuff out on the side of the road. That's that's the worst stuff. I know. I see the trash on the side of the road, and I can't stop and pick it up, even though yeah. I do. And it's just like, what is I the know. point of throwing it out the window anyway? Well, I can't think. I can remember drawing. Um, in school, I think it was about the sixth grade, they were asking people, uh, schools to, um, what, you know, about messing up the side of the road. This was a long time ago. And uh, I remember drawing a car in someone's hand, throwing a cigarette butt out. And that was my, you know, way of saying I didn't approve of their throwing stuff out on the side of the road. I think I still got the paint. I think I still got that thing around somewhere of that drawer and I did for school. <laughs> well, I have to break it to you. It, we are out of out of time. Okay. Okay, man. I can blab on for quite a while, but I guess I run out too. <laughs> and it was nice talking to you, dear. It was nice talking to you too. I, I enjoyed learning about you. Okay, thank you. I hope I you I'd be I thought I'd be scared, but you know, it wasn't bad at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not one to judge. I just I just go with the flow. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It was nice, so nice talking to you. It was really nice talking to you too. Okay. And it was really nice watching both of you talk and I loved it. So I'm going to stop the recording right now. And then we do still have a little bit of time if you just want to casually talk or shoot, shoot the breeze, but I will stop the recording right now. Okay. There we go.